Tonight we are talking about the romance of Abelard and Eloise, and we're also going to talk about their philosophical ideas because they're also um, two of the most important thinkers uh, in the Central Middle Ages in terms of a kind of a, a change in how Western thought went and progressed. And so. Um, they're remembered for the, the romance, and we're going to read um, some of their letters and the texts and, uh, and the passion, but we're also going to think about, anyway, the, the context of the ideas. So um, <laughs> there's a recurring uh, uh, theme, medieval theme, of Fortune's Wheel, and you, we're familiar with Wheel of Fortune as a game show that never ends, right? And <laughs> so it's going on and on and you're trying to do this. But um, there is also kind of an image that medieval people had in their heads uh, about um, you know, the inevitability of fortune and about um, why you actually can never actually trust a fortune. So essentially the idea that the medievals had is that fate is always sealed. Uh, you may well be in a place where uh, you know, you're a, a young up-and-coming knight, you become, let's say, uh, a well-established lord, you're at the top of your game, you're the king of the whole realm, but you can start to have that topple and fall and be, <laughs> you know, at any given time, you know, what you won't have what you have. Fortune, Dame Fortune turns her wheel as uh, the expression goes. So where does this um, image come from? We don't remember, but anyway, we had a lecture on Boethius, <laughs> and so Boethius, and it comes from uh, the Consolation of Philosophy. So it's a very important uh, if text that's on the threshold of the late antiquity, the early Middle Ages. Um, a, a Latin philosopher, a Christian philosopher, who um, is writing at the time of the when the Roman Empire has fallen in the West, and he has become the prime minister of the barbarian Ostrogothic kingdom. Anyway, and so he writes about this, and it's one of the, let's say, top 100 books of um, literature in the West. It's also, Fort Wheel of Fortune is, <laughs> if you know or Carl Orff <laughs> and Carmina Burana, there is also, yeah, we can't help but sing this song, right? It's just it's very striking. It's in all the, all the movies, <laughs> they, the, or especially previews of movies, because they can um, find it. But anyway, this, oh, oh Fortuna, you know, Velut Luna. I'm not going to sing it here right now. Oh, Fortuna, <laughs> I did. Velut <laughs> Luna, statu variabili, something like that. Anyway, um, and you can see, I wanted to just show it to you, because, um, we did last week when we were doing the Aeneid, I was showing you guys a little bit of classical Latin poetry and I was talking about how the point of it was, you know, there was like we talked about rhyme and reason, and so it had reason but not rhyme, which is to say it was metered, so it was going like that, you know, and that was how it was like um, all of the different epic poems were done in Latin. Now we can see what's happened in the Middle Ages is um, we have like rhyming going on. And Latin's it's so much easier to rhyme than English even that you can have like a rhymes very fast, you know, like every other couple words here are rhyming, right? So fortuna, vela luna, you know, statu variabis, semper creches, et ut, I'm sorry, out de creches, you know, that kind of thing. And so anyway, it goes on and on and on, and it's just even individual words, <laughs> ig estatem, post estatem, you know, and so they're able to do some very creative rhyming in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so it was, oh, fortune like the moon, you're changeable, ever waxing, ever waning. Hateful life first depresses, then soothes. Playing with mental clarity, poverty and power, it melts them like ice. Fate, monstrous and empty, your whirling wheel, you know, the wheel of fortune. You are male male malevolent, well-being is vain and always fades to nothing. Shadowed and veiled, you plague me too. Now, through the game, I bring my bear back to your villainy. Fate is against me in health and virtue. Driven on and weighted down, always enslaved. So at this hour, without delay, pluck the vibrating strings. Since faith strikes down the strong, everyone weep with me. So that's a, and, it, and it's, a, it's also a, a dramatic song too when it's in you know, the modern, the 21st century, I'm sorry, the 20th century uh, music that it's set to. But you can see kind of that fatalist um, um, idea here in Fortune's Wheel and this idea 
of fate and fortune, what it has for you. So what is Carmina Burana? Mm -hmm. So it's initially a manuscript of 254 poems, which are mostly written in Latin, medieval Latin, like we saw, rhymed Latin, uh, with, uh, from the 11th and 12th centuries, although there's some later uh, 13th century ones. Um, it's set to music famously by Carl Orff, and it's an amazing piece in the 30s, 1930s. Um, it's written by what people nowadays call Galliards which is to say student, cleric, vagabonds <laughs> who were associated with all of the early universities. So as universities were emerging in the central Middle Ages, there's a bunch of vagabond students that are running around. Uh, and it's not just fortune that they're singing about, we'll see. <laughs> so it's included our um, plenty of drinking songs, uh, plenty of love songs. There's all kinds of satire, mocking songs, songs that are mocking contemporary morals and things like that. Uh, the love songs are quite body. The drinking songs are quite body. So um, I mention it in that way because medieval pop culture, a lot of times we have this impression that everybody in the Middle Ages must be very, very prudish um, because we think, well, we look back and things were more prudish in the 50s and, and in the 50s it, things were more prudish back in the Victorian era. And so we think the past must always go in that direction. But in fact, uh, the fact that those kind of things wax and wane as the pendulum swings, as the fortune turns her wheel. So uh, the medieval, Middle Ages, for example, had almost nothing in the way of, in the, in the medieval West, in the way of a nudity taboo compared to later people. Um, so, I mean, they, they, they understood about nudity, but it wasn't the same deal as like the Victorian era is what I'm saying. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, uh, si puer cum pula lula. So if a boy with a girl Terry's in a little room, happy is their coupling, <laughs> love rises up, and between them, prudery is driven away, an ineffable game begins in their limbs, arms, and lips, and you can imagine that um, membris, lacertis, labiis, that these words are also puns, <laughs> right? So, anyway, so these are body <laughs> songs, right? Um, medieval Latin. So these are clerics that are writing these because but anyway, these are, um, anyway, why are we talking about it? So like, like I say, I think that um, a lot of people assume medieval people were really prudish. Um, however, uh, another reason to have brought this up in the first place is that Abelard himself, his life is like he's on the wheel of fortune because he has this amazing rise. He has uh, a peak where he's the top of his entire age. And then he has some real calamities as he himself calls them. <laughs> Uh, and so we'll see him, his entire way up and all around the Wheel of Fortune. What's the bird eating? Um, I don't know. It look, he's got some snack there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's definitely, you know, this is a young, um, well-to-do gentleman of the Central Middle Ages. He's, he has this um, courtly affair that he's having here. And of course, you know, one of those he's rich is that he's got a falcon, so that means that um, he's able oh, to course. do all those things. Of course, he's, he's it's a bit of meat that the falcon yeah. has come down to. Right. Well, it's a string underneath. Yeah, and he's attached, yeah. Which right. Is Oh, so he's it's, so it's for it's for um, one of the major ways that they would hunt is with with birds, right? With falcons and things like that, and so they send them <laughs> off to go get the birds for them. I knew it was a bird of prey. I didn't realize yeah. So um, another reason is so when we talked about these um, uh, these galliards, so these vagabond students, Abelard is one of the earliest groups of these. He's among the, these uh, early vagabond students as the universities are emerging in northern France. And indeed, um, uh, he becomes maybe the most famous of all of them, uh, and ultimately one of the teachers of it. He himself wrote unidentified or lost love poems from this exact time period. <laughs> and lots and lots of people have um, you know, suggested that this or that one poem from Carmina Verana may well have been written by Abelard, or even in some cases by Eloise, and um, uh, we can't ever know. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing where it's just a matter of, boy, look at he, how it's using this particular vocabulary. Abelard uses that uh, elsewhere. What we have is, um, uh, in terms of his poetry, he later writes a whole bunch of, of hymns, <laughs> But as you can imagine, they have a very different content to them. So it's hard to simply put one next to each other and say, 
hmm, I don't know, you know, this kind of a thing. So anyway, it's a possibility. So um, it's possible though also that the word Goliard um, uh, may actually derive from an association with Abelard personally. So uh, when we get to at the end of this, he has a big showdown. Abelard has a big showdown with the another towering figure of the um, 11th century here, Bernard of Clairvaux. And Bernard, um, nevertheless, likened himself to David, hoping to challenge an intellectual Goliath, Abelard. So Abelard is the great, um, let's say, debate champion, the great uh, uh, of his entire era. Uh, Bernard is the greatest preacher of his time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he can't have Abelard, you know, talks, you know, circles around him logically. And so he was. He actually said that it would be like David going up against Goliath as a way to get out of the, the debate, right? <laughs> but all of his friends you know, forced him to go do it anyway. Uh, he was trying to not have to do it. But it shows, in that sense, Abelard's contemporary reputation and also, though, that because of the fact that he's called a Goliath, then the fact that all of these vagabond students are called Goliathites or whatever, Gol, you know, Goliards, if that may well be the origin of the term and so that association happening. And so these Carmina Burana poems that we're, we're used to, maybe a little familiar with from Carmina Burana, um, it has this connection with this particular topic that we're talking about tonight. Okay, so who's Abelard? <laughs> so Peter Abelard is born at the end of the 11th century and, at the, and lives through uh, the beginning of the 12th. And so this is this, um, kind of amazing moment when Europe having been, Western Europe having been at this very serious downswing uh, in terms of having like massive population loss and uh, a long period of time when uh, there's an unraveling of state society. So the state gets less and less capable of doing very much. <laughs> Uh, and so the, and then there's a whole long period of time when the Western Europeans are subject to raids and things like that. Well, now things have turned around and due to a bunch of different factors, including uh, technological advance and other things, um, Europe's population has begun to uh, explode. And indeed, it's getting to at this point to be more people in Western Europe than there actually had been in Western Europe at the time of the Roman Empire. So it's now actually um, able to do more even uh, than Rome in some cases. All the people at the time didn't realize that. So Abelard is from that time period, right at the beginning of this upswing when Europe is gonna really take off. He's the son of a French knight, so he's from a lower um, nobility family. His father's name is Berengar, and he's born in a place, a little place that's a little east of Nantes in Brittany, Brittany. and so Brittany is that part of France that sticks out into the uh, Atlantic. And so it's a place where people actually speak Breton, which is a different language than uh, the Romance languages of the people around them. However, um, as is always the case when they have Celtic places, the Celts aren't very good at um, ha you know, forming up together and having one big kingdom. And so they therefore uh, get divided and conquered <coughs> all the time. So the French are routinely able, including Abelard's family, uh, to be kind of the noble leaders who own the land and things like that in the territory. So his father, Berengar, encouraged his studies and what ends up happening, Peter, uh, actually, I'm gonna stop calling him Peter soon, but he hasn't adopted the name Abelard yet. So Abelard is a name he picks for himself when he goes to school. Um, but uh, anyway, Peter anyway ultimately renounces his inheritance uh, just to become a scholar. So he's not going to inherit his um, father's profession of being a knight, nor his estates, nor responsibilities or anything like that. Instead, he became a wandering student at the moment when the whole cathedral school system of Western Europe uh, was giving birth now to the emerging universities. And so the, emerg the universities that we're all familiar with, the University of Toronto here, Ryerson, all of the other universities, have ultimately their origin, this transformation that takes place at this moment, at the end of the, um, uh, you know, anyway, the 1100s here. So the cathedral schools. Just wanna have a little bit of context for how education worked in the central Middle Ages. So Charlemagne, who was responsible for all kinds of things in terms of the kind of that low moment that Europe had been in, a, a, a moment of light um, for the West. He ruled then at the late eighth and early ninth centuries, so a few centuries before Abelard is around, and he decreed that all of the bishops in his realm, so he's the in charge of the Frankish kingdom, which later um, 
later as the Holy Roman Empire. And so um, he uh, has two, um, two major types of officials that he sends out from his court. He has a more military, secular official that is called the Companion uh, to the Emperor, and Companion in Latin is Comes, and Comes is the word for Count. <laughs> And so those, if you think of counts and things like that, those local officials. Uh, and then the other one is the, uh, uh, the bishop. And so the bishops are also uh, appointed from the, uh, uh, by the king and, uh, or, or anyway, with the king's um, approval at this point still. And uh, he decrees then that his uh, Episcopal officials, each one of them in their cathedral, which is the seat of a bishop. So each bishop, it's not the building so much as the bishop's chair. And so in that, they might have a big building that we think of as a cathedral that's associated with it, but they also then establish a school. And the school will probably be related to um, an, a, a kind of uh, local clergies called canons that are running the school. So in Abelard's day, <clears throat> many of these cathedral schools, especially in France and Italy, were very well established, and they were training students in Latin, and uh, also what we call the seven liberal arts. And so the seven liberal arts, this is the core of the medieval, actually late antique and all through the Middle Ages, and actually all the way up through British prep schools, I think, <laughs> you know, until quite recently. Uh, anyway, a couple hundred years recently for me. So uh, uh, there, and this is an image of essentially how knowledge works. It's a, um, a visualization from a medieval manuscript. And so uh, you have at the center, Lady Philosophy. Lady Philosophy training at her feet here are Socrates and Plato. And then all the way around, we have the uh, seven liberal arts you know, who are the things are the three, which are called the, I'm sorry, the four, the quadrivian, uh, which are called, which are music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, which is the same as astrology. And then the trivium, uh, which is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so that's pretty well the basis of what they would be teaching. And they're called liberal arts because it's, those were deemed to be the things that you should learn about, you know, a proper thing to learn about if you're a free person, right? as opposed to um, vocational arts or something like that, that would have been, um, anyway, what the Romans wouldn't have thought, it, thought as highly of. Uh, anyway, so in terms of their understanding of what, you know, nobility and that kind of a thing. But in any event, these are the, part, these are the curriculum that was then taught, um, established by people like Boethius at the um, very end of late antiquity, and then all through the Middle Ages in the Latin West. Um, this is what the cathedral schools are teaching, and it's also a lot of the curriculum of the emerging universities. So what changes at this moment that the universities are coming into being, this moment uh, that Abelard is actually helping to shape, <coughs> is that there is a new focus on the, the second of those three parts of the trivium. So it's like I say, grammar, logic, <coughs> and rhetoric. So grammar is the, you know, the parts of how to speech works and everything like that, so words, what they mean, and all that sort of thing. Um, then rhetoric is how do you make convincing arguments using all sorts of uh, flowery speech and allusions, appeals to emotion, all of these kind of things, a way to compel your audiences in a sermon or a, uh, a speech or any other kind of thing. But logic uh, is, a, is a system of tools that you understand about where you are operating rationally only as opposed to um, like an emotional appeal that you might make in, in uh, rhetoric. And so um, there had only been, uh, although the ancient Greeks had like kind of a vast logical theories of which then Aristotle kind of had the biggest and most elaborated one that displaced all the others. And a lot of cases when we think of um, logic, if we think of what, I don't know, Mr. Spock is talking about, He's talking about Aristotelian logic usually, um, even though he's from Vulcan, right? Because <laughs> uh, that's just how we use the word as Aristotle's kind of uh, logical system often, or at least it always was in this time period. Um, but very little 
of that logical system was available to the people in the medieval Latin West because they didn't remember how to speak Greek. And so there was very little, um, very few of the scholars or anybody who could read Greek. They're all spending all of their time just learning Latin, which isn't this language they're speaking in daily life anymore. And it's essential for them for both uh, ecclesiastical things, doing all of the liturgy of the church, but also for any scholarship, any and all scholarship, which is still entire, entirely conducted in Latin now. And so if it's not in, if it's a Greek text of Aristotle that wasn't in Latin, they didn't have it yet. So all they had in terms of this logical apparatus was that Boethius, this guy who was so responsible for you know, setting a lot of these things rolling at the beginning of the uh, Middle Ages, had translated parts of Aristotle's categories and his uh, concerning interpretation. And so these are just logical tools that Aristotle explained, and that, and that got the medieval Westerners pretty far. But now what's happened is that because there is uh, this amazing, there's been this amazing um, Islamic Renaissance uh, that has as one of its principal um, places of, uh, you know, of thought uh, emerging and things like that, Andalusia, which is to say Muslim Spain. So because Muslim Spain has been this um, really center of culture, and because there are Christians there, and because there are Jews there, and there are Jews and Christians that are just in the Christian part of Spain, um, there's been able to be a transmission of these texts. And so all of these medieval uh, Muslim scholars who are doing their work, they've translated all of the Greek texts into Arabic, and they've been struggling with them themselves to ask themselves, how can I rationalize what Aristotle says with what I understand from Quran, right? And so they're trying to put um, uh, Islam and Aristotelian logic together, and they write a whole bunch of um, commentaries and treaties and philosophy about how to do that. And so then, um, from the Arabic, often, often with help from uh, Jews <laughs> too, the, um, uh, who also spoke Arabic in Spain, there would the Christians would get those texts then translated uh, into Latin, and you can imagine it's not the greatest translation if it's already gone from Greek to Arabic to, you know, kind of a, people trying to get from Arabic to Latin. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, it worked and it stimulated a lot of thought because he's not only just getting Aristotle, you're also getting Maimonides, you're also getting um, uh, uh, Abyssina, you're always, you're getting all of the different Muslim and Jewish uh, Spanish. Um, commentaries, and that's helping stimulate the thought uh, for people like Abelard, who are reading it in the translation in Latin. So as it becomes um, um, more possible, the, the thought in, in Latin West just goes nuts for logic. And indeed, for a couple hundred years, that's all they care about almost. And so it's almost, the, you wouldn't think of the Central Middle Ages as being like the most logical time <laughs> you know, in history, but it's certainly the time when people were more obsessed with logic, uh, the intellectuals anyway, than almost any other time. So, um, we have here a picture of Boethius getting visited by Lady Philosophy and the Seven Liberal Arts. So there's this renewed awareness uh, instilled in philosophers, like people like Anselm of Beck. We had an entire um, lecture on him a couple years ago. Um, he wanted to, he ultimately becomes Archbishop of Canterbury. He wants to uh, apply these logical tools to every portion of inquiry, including Theology. So the same issue that uh, Muslims had been having with rationalizing Islam with Aristotle, now all the Christians are working through Christianity and Aristotle. And so Anselm, for example, attempted to prove the existence of God by reason alone with his ontological argument. And so you, his goal and his contention was that we can prove um, lots of things, you know, God existing and lots of things about God um, just based on reason. And uh, right from the start, people didn't necessarily um, agree with him, so he had a lot of pushback even from monks at his own time, and he certainly has had pushback ever since. But some of, uh, I mean, we were quite, you were, were quite familiar with some ontological arguments because he's quite influential on Descartes, and so you've, you've heard, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> That's an ontological argument, you know, and so it's not one for God, but actually Descartes goes from that one and gets to God, proving God exists too, in using his reason. <laughs> so in any event, event, that's one of the goals of what they're doing, but they're focused on reason alone. So it's also, though, um, part of, in addition to um, the way the logic, the, the logical apparatus that they have is a specialized one called dialectic. 
And so the new logic that they're getting from Aristotle uh, is a system of establishing truth. Let's say if you have different viewpoints, and so how do you, um, you know, reason between con different conflicting views, right? And so, as I mentioned, this differs from let's, the way we think of, let's say, a debate, which can, uh, you know, like if you're having especially a political debate, that a political debate often isn't based on reason at all. <laughs> um, in some cases, reason is, I guess, now banished from the debate, <laughs> right? And so instead, it's entirely based on rhetorical or emotional devices, you know, those kind of things. And so this is different. So this is a debate which is, banishes all of those things and only uses reason, right? So dialectical disputation then emerged as a new exciting way for scholars to engage and teach students. So one of the things that had always been the case before is that uh, in the cathedral schools is what they do is they would read. Um, you just start a big lecture and you would read from uh, uh, the church fathers. So just start reading the text of Augustine and then we just start reading the glosses. So everything that the past teachers wrote on every one of those sentences, we read those. And you can imagine, and then and maybe, maybe the lecture then provides their own gloss now too on the gloss. And so um, you can imagine it's boring. <laughs> so, you know, and now what's happened to get um, people very excited is that they're lining up different competing authorities <laughs> And then they're using um, argumentative logic in order to prove which one of them is right, you know. And so this made everybody, you know, like very, very excited. And one of the reasons what made uh, the fact that there is this now emerging group of vagabond students, these Galliards and Goliards and everything else. So how does it work? <laughs> This is going to, we don't, we, we're going to have a whole lecture on dialectic sometime, and so we can't go into it for too long, but essentially a dialectic teaching, um, it's again a logical structure and tools. They'll start by listing off the question to be determined. So it's asked whether um, all dogs go to heaven, right? And so that's a, you know, this is, a, it, that's asked where that is. Okay, so then it, a, a provi you know, a provisory answer to the question, and it seems, that all dogs go, do go to heaven. <laughs> so, okay, so that, might be, the, that would, might be the answer to the question, right? So they list the principal arguments in favor uh, of that answer. Well, there's a movie <laughs> about that, right? <laughs> and so there's, and that showed that it was. And, you know, and then other, and we'd list off all the other authorities who have told us that, you know, that all dogs go to heaven. Now, though, then we cite the arguments against the provisory answer. Traditionally, it'll be a single argument from authority. Um, but, but St. Augustine reminds us that dogs do not have souls, so it's impossible for them to go to heaven. <laughs> Oh no, I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt anybody here. <laughs> anyway, and then after that, we go through the determination, we weigh through all that evidence between those conflicting authorities, and then there's finally then the reply uh, that the speaker, the professor, the lecturer here, the philosopher has uh, to each of those objections. And so those objections were things like that dogs don't have souls. Well, maybe, you know, there's some kind of a thing, well, uh, maybe the, he meant that they don't have a kind of a rational soul, but there is an animative soul, and so the animative soul will find its way into animated heaven, which is dog heaven, not into uh, the rational heaven that we maybe are thinking of. So whatever, whatever the answer is, but that's essentially how that technique works, and you can imagine that it would be lively, right, <laughs> compared to just reading Augustine. <laughs> so, so. For Abelard, then, he goes from being a student to being a teacher. He's one of the keenest intellects of his day. He routinely uh, bests everyone at this kind of dialectical uh, um, argumentation, disputation. And so he, um, on the one hand, has all of these different authorities at his fingertips. He just has a, a Rolodex in his brain, and he's able to just you know, um, make them all come out all the time. And he's also uh, a great speaker. He's very clever. He's able to um, immediately register logical objections. and so. What ends up happening is that all of the famous teachers in these emerging universities, he bests them all. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, because he's also he's kind of a, he's a vain guy, <laughs> and he's got a you know big personality, and he likes to you know rub people's noses in it. And so he's not the most humble guy when he's beating his teachers at these things. And you can imagine then that he therefore earned several lifelong enemies of important. Um, intellectuals in the university system. So not only, for example, the big teachers of his day who he 
just dismiss as as uh, empty-headed, you know, uh, babblers. Of, you know, he, he's quite um, dismissive of them, <laughs> and, and in in public. Uh, and so, in, in not only them though, but they have, in often cases, they may already have, let's say, a very close relationship with their particular, let's say, apprentice student kind of thing. And so some of those guys then go on to also be important um, teachers in the emerging university system, and they're also Abelard's enemy for his attack on their, you know, their teacher, right? So at a certain point, he's kicked out of class by his various teachers, uh, and when he does that, often what he does is he goes to the next hill over, and he starts teaching a class there. His classes are more entertain entertaining and energizing, and since the students um, can go wherever they want, you know, they, they go, they frequently go over there, and that's also, again, brings an enmity. Um, indeed, uh, one of the ways when we um, look at the origin of the uh, University of Paris itself, um, so Abelard went and did that. He set up uh, in a class in Paris on Mount Saint Genevieve, which ultimately evolved into the medieval French University. There was it had to get refounded again too, so it doesn't and it doesn't entirely exist since the French um, since the French Revolution anyway. But in any event, it it is a major moment of university founding, and the popularity of Abelard's classes is one of the things that drew all the best students to Paris, and Paris becomes uh, within a couple hundred years here the center of theology study in the Latin West anyway. And that's Notre Dame, and, um, and so he is, a, at a certain point, master of the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, and he's also a canon, which is to say a, a local cleric that is attached and, and uh, gets essentially his livelihood from the, the local cathedral. But this is a later um, elimination, so there, we don't have an early enough one, so they hadn't built the cathedral yet. So the present cathedral, there was a Notre Dame, or there was a cathedral anyway, I don't know if it was Notre Dame, but anyway, he, yeah, what is Notre Dame? Anyway, but it's not this one. So the one that, that we have that burned but is going to be fixed um, is built a little after. Anyway, while he's heading, he goes back and forth and goes around to different places. Uh, we don't need to watch, go through all that, but while he is uh, head of the cloister school in Paris, that's when he meets Eloise. And so who's Eloise? So Abelard says, um, at the time that he met Eloise, she's already the most renowned female scholar of her day. Um, so uh, different places in the letters, um, it's mentioned, for example, that she's um, very skilled in uh, uh, Greek. And as I mentioned, that's very rare still in the Latin West. Um, there are more specialists who are starting to learn Greek, and that especially happens in a couple hundred years after this. But Abelard himself only has a few words of Greek and isn't very good at it. That's not his thing. Uh, and it's also said, anyway, that Eloise knew Hebrew. Um, how much Hebrew she knew, we don't know. <laughs> but in any event, um, this puts her in a completely different kind of class than a lot of the contemporary scholars of the medieval West. We don't know when she was born. So she could have been anywhere from her late teens. So classically, in, in kind of the early modern age, as people were kind of doing the romance of Abelard and Eloise, they assumed that she was 17. We don't have a particularly um, great evidence for any date for her. So she's a young woman, they use the word for, and so that's what, kind of on the basis of saying that, um, they've said maybe 17, but it could be anything. And, uh, but later, there's a, uh, the only other thing that's, that kind of um, com comes against that. So in other words, as people have been arguing more recently for a date, let's say, in her early 20s. Um, so she, she's already a renowned scholar. <laughs> um, and then also, ultimately, there's two other things. So uh, when she becomes a nun, she very rapidly becomes the prioress, which is to say right under the abbess. And so if she was really young, that would be rarer. And then finally, um, an important uh, later abbot, Peter the Venerable, abbot of Cluny, uh, in a letter to her says, uh, when I was a young man and you were a woman, I, you know, I met you this and that or whatever. So the implication of that letter sort of is maybe she's actually a little older than Peter the Venerable. And so that would make her a little older than what people have traditionally thought. Anyway, we don't know. I'm just saying it could be 17, she could be mid 20s, let's say. Abelard is about 36 at the time they meet. So they're different in age, for, for sure. So her background, 
she'd been brought up in the convent of Argentul, which is uh, northwest of Paris, but she had not taken vows and was not a nun, and so this is a thing that, let's say, an upper middle class person or a uh, noblewoman would be able to do. You would essentially, people didn't sit around, the nobles and, and wealthy people didn't sit around and raise their own kids. So you would, and the knights and the kings even, uh, would send people off to be raised by, um, like when there's a whole troop of young little, you know, let's say knight boys <laughs> that are all kind of in some castle together and they're, and they're all learning the kind of knightly trade all together and then you get them back later, right? <laughs> and same thing, you send all the girls off to the convents. But they don't take the veil and they don't become nuns, but, they're, but this is where the schools are anyway, right? So if you are going to send the boys all off to cathedral school too, so that they can learn Latin and those kind of things, and so that's where people would go. So her family was apparently, um, in terms of nobility, lower in status than Abelard. So he's a knightly family there. She is from like a next level down maybe of, like I'm calling here upper middle class, but essentially it's a people that have a high administrative roles and maybe you know, also rich merchant class, um, but as not necessarily the, the nobility. And so they're very wealthy and well connected. And at the time she met Abelard in 1115, she was the ward of her uncle Fulbert uh, who, like Abelard, was a canon in Paris, and so he's a, a doctor in the, attached to the school, just like Abelard, doctor of philosophy, and um, uh, is, anyway, uh, has the same kind of job. So he has a job attached to the church. He's a cleric. This is where we have the word, um, you know, nephewism. You know, she's a niece. It's niecism here, but <laughs> anyway, nepotism. Nepos in Latin is is uh, as nephew. So, ne uh, so the clerks, if they don't, ha they're not supposed to have kids <laughs> anyway. So if they don't have kids, but they, they they usually have nieces and nephews, and so they get places for them at the different schools and stuff. Okay, so let's look a, li a little bit at the love affair of Abelard and Eloise. So how do we know about this story? So the primary narrative that we have was written by Abelard some 15 to 17 years after it happened. So the text is taken in the form of a letter to a friend, and he titles it the Historia Calamitatum, which is to say the history or the story of my misfortunes. Um, it takes the form of a letter, but it's also just written as a personal history. And so even though it's meant to be ostensibly a private letter, it's probably meant to be circulated. So he probably was trying to kind of um, send out, a, people would write letters as a rhetorical form, right? Uh, perhaps with the hope of having Abelard get released from this duty he's, he had of, as abbot of this really terrible abbey that he was abbot of way off in remote Brittany. So he had agreed to go be abbot of this place. Uh, at a certain point, he really doesn't want to be anymore, but you have to get permission to be released from being an abbot. And so he may be trying to um, get sympathy, you know, to have that kind of thing happen so we can come back to Paris area and go back to teaching like he would like to do. So um, we'll read a little bit of Abelard's uh, explanation of what happened. So just to, from by way of his own background, as he describes that I was my father's eldest and consequently his favorite son. He took more than ordinary care of my education. I had a natural genius to study and made extraordinary progress in it. Smitten with the love of books and the praises which on all sides were bestowed upon me, I aspired to no reputation but what proceeded from learning. So you can see he's very humble. <laughs> so <laughs> you can kind of start to see his personality, right? So to my brothers, I left the glory of battles. So his dad's a knight and he's leaving to his brother the glory of battles and the pomp of triumphs. Nay more, I yielded them up my birthright and patrimony. So he's giving up any claims he has to all the property and, and the knightly residence and everything like that. I knew the necessity was great. The, I knew necessity was the great spur to study and was afraid I should not merit the title of learned if I distinguish myself from others by nothing more than a plentiful fortune. So he's not just going to live off a patrimony here, he's going to go around and be a wandering student and he can live off of his intellect because he's that genius, that he's that smart, right? Did he feel like that was a calling, do you think? The question is, did he feel like it's a calling? And um, I, I, he's not describing it here as a, um, he's not describing it here as a religious calling. So uh, he definitely thinks that he's better at it and he also uh, is in love with it, we'll see. He ultimately, um, you know, it transforms at a certain point in the story for him to uh, a, a calling. 
a calling to, which he does kind of almost the same thing, but he, he makes it more religious when he, when he does have it. Uh, and we'll see at the twist of the story when that happens. <laughs> Okay, so of all the sciences, he says, logic was the most to my taste. So we've already talked about that, how logic is becoming really exciting to everybody. Such were the arms that I chose to profess. So he's going to be using books and logic instead of uh, lances and swords. Furnished with the weapons of reasoning, I took pleasure in going to public disputations to win trophies. And wherever I had, uh, sorry, wherever I heard that this art flourished, I ranged like another Alexander from province to province, seeking new adversaries <coughs> with whom I might try my strength. And of course, like Alexander, he vanquishes them all because he's so much better at this kind of logic and disputation than everybody else. In a short time, I had made such, pro such a progress that others chose me for their director. The number of my scholars were incredible. <laughs> and the, gratitude, uh, the gratuities I received from them were answerable to the great reputation I had acquired. So he um, is proud of where he's been, right? So on the other hand, he is going to be writing here, he's writing about the Wheel of Fortune, right? And so he is on the upswing in this part of the history of his calamities is the title of this work, right? <laughs> so there was in Paris a young creature Ah, uh, Philintus, he's, he's technically writing to um, his friend, right? So he's calling a friend, but it's a, just kind of means friend here. <laughs> so it's probably not a real guy. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, he's, he's, there was in Paris a young creature formed in a prodigality of nature to show mankind a finished composition. Dear Eloise, the reputed uh, niece of, with great reputation, right? The, it should be... In, niece of great reputation, as opposed to reputed. I, this is uh, anyway, not the newest translation. Of one Fulbert, a canon. Her wit and her beauty would have fired the dullest and most insensible heart. And her education was equally admirable. Eloise was a mistress of the most polite arts. You can easily imagine that this did not a little uh, help to captivate me. I saw her, I loved her, I resolved to endeavor to gain her affections. The thirst of glory cooled immediately in my heart, and my passions were lost. I'm sorry, all my passions were lost to this new one. I thought of nothing but Eloise. Everything brought her image to my mind. So he has become very obsessed uh, once he meets this woman who is absolutely perfect, as far as he can see. By the, office, I'm sorry, by the offices of common friends, I gained the acquaintance of Fulbert, as you can, and can you believe it, Philintus, he allowed me the privilege of his table and an apartment is in, a house, in his house. So he gets to move in with those guys, with them. <laughs> so I would not have exchanged my happy condition for that of the greatest monarch upon earth. I saw Eloise, I spoke to her, each action, each confused look told her the trouble of my soul, and she, on the other side, gave me ground to hope for everything from her generosity. So they're flirting at the dinner table. <laughs> so <laughs> Fulbert desired me to instruct her in philosophy, <laughs> of course. By this means, I found opportunities of being in private with her, and yet I was sure of, uh, uh, of all men the most timorous in declaring my passion. So he doesn't want to. You know, he doesn't want to mess this up, <laughs> right? But he is get a pretty good situation. <laughs> so, okay. As I was uh, with her one day alone, I said, Charming Eloise, said I, blushing, if you know yourself, you will not be surprised with what passion you have inspired me with. Uncommon as it is, I can express it, uh, but with the common terms. I love you, adorable Eloise. Till now, I thought philosophy made us masters of all our passions and that it was a refuge from the storms in which weak mortals are tossed and shipwrecked. But you have destroyed my security and broken this philosophic courage. I have despised riches, honor, and the, its pageantries and could never raise a uh, weak thought. I mean, sorry, the, its pageantries uh, could never raise a weak thought in me. Beauty alone hath fired my soul. Happy if she who raised this passion kindly receives the declaration, but if it is, uh, but but if it is an offense, dot dot dot. You know he trails off. <laughs> She's about to interrupt him. Actually, 
Um, but you can see how philosophical a suggestion this is. <laughs> so if you, um, you know, if we maybe even remembered our Boethius in reading the Constellation of Philosophy, you know, and what he's kind of saying here is, you don't, what, it, what, is, a, what is a philosopher, you know, want? They don't find, you're not going to find anything, you know, a good person doesn't require, you know, just to say a philosopher, when you're living the good life, it's not, it's not coming from riches. It's not coming from, you know, uh, from honor. It's not coming from power. He's turned all of those things away because he wants only, you know, what's good, which is to say, in this case, also beauty. But beauty is one of the things that philosophers appreciate, and that's why he's, you know, so appreciated her that he's lost, you know, all of his philosophical uh, kilter, and he's now in the storm, right, of passion, you know. So it's a very philosophical subjection, right? Um, what else was it? Yeah, all right. And so she, though, breaks in. No, replied Eloise, she must be very ignorant of your merits who can be offended at your passion. But for my own repose, I wish either that you had not made this declaration or that I were at liberty not to suspect your sincerity. <laughs> ah, divine Eloise, said I, flinging myself at her feet, I swear by yourself, I was going to convince her of the truth of my passion, but I heard a noise. It was Fulbert. <laughs> so you can see it's a very exciting thing. You know, he's, they're in the same house here. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so he goes on to compare their romance, you know, as Fulbert is kind of, it's like a sitcom. Fulbert is like coming in and they're like, you know, and all this kind of thing. And he compares it to the, the romance of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is this uh, story that goes back to the Roman times to Ovid, where they have a, if you've, yeah, if you've seen, um, What's the what, when, the play Midsummer Night's Dream? Right, yeah. The the the, the bottom and the playwrights, uh, the, they they they're playing this out and they're talking through the chink of the <laughs> anyway of of the wall. And so he says essentially, um, you know, but unlike Pyramus and Thisbe, because I was able to get you know sneak into the actual bedchambers here because I'm living in the same house. You know, we did we did a lot more than. You know, you know, talk through a, a hole in the wall. <laughs> so anyway, so that's more or less what he says. Anyway, that Pyramus and Thisbe, it's a classical illusion when he wants to, again, he's showing all the way through this, um, this kind of erudition, and this is a, a very elevated romance that they're having. It's essentially the classical precursor of the Romeo and Juliet is one, a retelling of that story. So the affair is exposed. So Abelard is so overtaken with love that he replaces the study of Aristotle with Ovid. <laughs> so Ovid, who um, is the author of the Ars Amatoris, the art of love, and other love poems and actually body poems from ancient Rome. And he spends all his time composing love poems, these love songs like the Carmen and Burana, right? So people pretty quick figure it's out what's going on. He actually does a little bit of bragging too, and that leads to gossip. <laughs> Uh, that gossip gets pretty quickly back to Fulbert, who is, of course, furious. So Fulbert then separates them. They're not living in the same house anymore, but they continue to meet in secret, and sort of inevitably, Eloise then becomes pregnant. Do -do -do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so what happens? So Abelard then sends Eloise to live with his sister in Brittany. So she's going to go have the kid there. And when, she's, uh, uh, when she has this child, it's a son, and she names the child Astrolabe. And so I'm just saying, that's a good baby name. So people watching, <laughs> you know, Astrolabe. There you go. So yeah, their kid is named Astrolabe. And so an Astrolabe is a uh, medieval scientific instrument for uh, doing astronomy and astrology. And, uh, and it essentially had been developed in the uh, Muslim world, and it was all over the place in Andalusia. <laughs> and so those were making their way north into France from there. Um, so they called a kid that. <laughs> so they're very, they're very with it. I mean, that's like moonbeam, I guess, probably, right? <laughs> so to appease full bear, um, Abelard then proposes marrying Eloise in secret. Um, he has to do that because if he had a wife, uh, he wouldn't be able to be a canon anymore, and he wouldn't be able to damage his reputation as a teacher and a cler cleric and everything like that. Uh, and so Eloise, though, is very opposed to the idea of marriage, um, and she isn't opposed to the idea of a secret marriage. She's opposed to marrying, <laughs> you know, Abelard, because, um, we'll see, but anyway, because she... Um, uh, goes through a whole litany of ancient philosopher examples and say philosophers don't you know muck around by getting married you know this is one of the things that we want that's like the greco-roman ideal here 
uh, and indeed maybe one of the reasons why um, that ideal gets imposed onto Christian clergy. The only reason why Christians were maybe got obsessed with sex and no sex in the first place is from Greek and Roman philosophy because it doesn't really exist in, in Judaism. And so anyway, so this is a, a philosophical ideal and you're going to be violating that. How can you be, you know, our era is Aristotle if you're, you know, going to be, you know, spending all your time raising kids and stuff, right? So they have a secret marriage. <laughs> However, as you can imagine for Fulbert, um, a secret solution to a very, very, very public scandal is like no solution at all as far as Fulbert is concerned. And so you can imagine that he's pretty quick to start spreading around the fact that that's what, this is what happens, that they've been gotten married. As he discloses the marriage publicly, El Eloise then denies that it has happened. <laughs> So she says, I'm, we're not married. You know, so she publicly um, denies that it exists, but the scandal becomes very notorious. So Abelard then urges her to go into seclusion back at that convent, uh, Argentuil, where she had been raised. So this is that convent where she grew up that's northwest of Paris. And although, again, she doesn't become a nun, um, Fulbert believes that Abelard is trying to get rid of her by having her become a nun, right? And so that's kind of where they're at. So here's what Abelard writes happens next in his History of His Calamities. Now I thought Fulbert's anger disarmed. I lived in peace, but alas, our marriage proved but a weak defense against his revenge. Observe, Philintus, to what a barbarity he pursued it. He bribed my servants. An assassin came into my bedchamber by night with a razor in his hand, and he found me deep in sleep. I suffered the most shameful punishment that the revenge of an enemy could invent. In short, without losing my life, I lost my manhood. I was punished and indeed the offending, I'm sorry, I was punished indeed in the offending part, but the desire was left me, but not the possibility of satisfying the passion. Surprised he didn't believe in that. Yeah. Well, so he lived through it, but obviously this is a, a very, you know, anyway, terrible thing. So cruel an action escaped, not unpunished. The villain suffered the same infliction. So the servants who got bribed and the assassins are, you know, are, are low, you know, low class people. So they got punished for it. Um, actually not Fulbert though. So Fulbert was able to simply publicly deny that he had anything to do with it. And so then all he ended up um, doing was he lost his benefice, um, but not, wasn't further punished. So I confess to you, um, uh, poor comfort to so irretrievable and evil. So he's not getting a lot of comfort that the servants got punished. I confess uh, to you shame uh, more than any sincere penitence made me resolve to hide myself from Eloise. Jealousy took possession of my mind. At the very expense of her happiness, I decreed to disappoint all rivals. Uh, before I put myself in a cloister, I obliged her to take the habit and retire to the nunnery, into the nunnery of Argatul. I remember uh, somebody would have opposed her making such a cruel sacrifice of herself, but she answered in the words of Cornelia after the death of Pompey the Great. <laughs> so in other words, these guys are very classically trained people and all they do is they are just, you know, they're, you know, quoting Pompey the Great's wife, Cornelia, when Pompey, um, you know, Pompey's that great rival of Caesar. He uh, has his head cut off, we remember, in the Antony and Cleopatra lecture. Uh, and so his, her wife, I'm sorry, his wife, uh, says at that time, oh, my loved Lord, our fatal marriage draws on thee this doom, and I the guilty cause, then whilst thou ghost the extremes of fate to prove, I'll share that fate and, and expiate thus my love. So she commits suicide, right? And so um, it's not suicide here, but he's essentially, you get to share my fate in the monastery, <laughs> right? You know, so that's what she's going to do. Speaking these verses, she marched up to the altar and took the veil with a constancy which, uh, which I could not have expected in a woman who had so high a taste of pleasure, which she might still enjoy. So they were having a lot of sex. <laughs> she has not been castrated, you know, but she is now going to be a nun too. I blushed at my own weakness and without deliberating a moment longer, I buried myself in a cloister resolving to vanquish a fruitless passion. Okay, so that's the end of the affair part, you know, of the romance of Abelard and Lily Louise, but that's not necessarily, as you could imagine, as these guys are very philosophical uh, and intellectual, that's not the end of uh, the romance in the sense of the love, right? 
So moving on though to life in the monasteries and uh, monasteries. So although reluctant to become a nun and she didn't have a sense of calling, uh, she went like she she wanted to be loyal to her husband lover, you know, like Cornelia was to Pompey, right? And so she took the veil without a sense of uh, calling as a nun. Nevertheless, she quickly rose to, rose to the rank of prioress. And so the prioress is the the woman that's immediately under the abbess. So it's a very important um, responsibility and it's in charge of, among other things, all of the education for all of the young novices, all the young nuns. And so you can imagine that she, Eloise in her own right, has now become a good teacher and a great teacher and so she's uh, imparting that education. Abelard entered the important Abbey of Saint-Denis. And we might remember, we talked about in the Gothic Revival, um, uh, not the Gothic Revival, it was Gothic, when Gothic was modern, <laughs> that lecture a couple months ago. And so we talked about how the Abbey Church here of, of Saint-Denis is like the first Gothic um, invention of Gothic. And so this is the same church. They haven't built it yet because um, the abbot, uh, who when Abelard goes there, is the abbot immediately before Suger. <laughs> So that, that very famous abbot of Saint-Denis that is, a, is, is a gonna invent Gothic or is gonna ha build the first Gothic church um, is, is the abbot when, anyway, well, Abelard's there, but just not yet, so they haven't built it yet. So anyway, Abelard enters this monastery, uh, but quickly gets tired of being a monk inside a cloister. He's, he likes the public, he likes showing off, all that kind of thing, right? So he reopens his classes at one of the monastery's priories, so it owns a lot of little land all over the place. He goes to some hill where it has a little shop and he sets up class and immediately um, all the students flock to him like always, it doesn't matter. And so he begins, in fact, the most productive phase of his intellectual life. So he's now newly focused back on studies. He's not writing love poems or thinking about Ovid anymore. Um, for good reason. <laughs> so anyway, so one of the things that he produces is a great work um, called Seek et Non, which is to say yes and no. Uh, and so when he writes uh, in such, with such a quantity of words, some of the writings of the saints seem not only to differ from, but even to contradict each other, one should not rashly pass judgment. So he's going to deal, he's trying to deal with this thing. So we have had in all of our history going back, um, an appeal to authority. So we have the authority of scripture. We have the authority of the apostles and the saints. We have the authority of all of the church fathers and everything like that. We have the authority of Aristotle and Plato and everybody. But what happens when uh, these things contradict each other? When there's all of these words. So the saints wrote a lot of stuff. <laughs> Aristotle wrote a lot of stuff. All of these words at some point or other con contradict each other. So let's not be rash when it's happening and rashly pass judgment. Because we have to realize, he says, doubtless, doubtless the fathers might err. So all of those church fathers, those saints, they might actually make mistakes. Even Peter, the prince of the apostles, fell into error. So there is a story in the Gospels that Peter denies Christ three times, you know, and so here he is. He's the chief of all the apostles. He's in error in the scripture itself, right? Uh, what wonder then that the saints do not always show themselves to be inspired? The fathers did not believe, uh, did not themselves believe that they or their companions were always right. Augustine found himself mistaken in some cases and did not hesitate to retract his errors. He warns his admirers not to look upon his letters as they would look upon the scriptures, but to accept only those things which upon examination they found to be true. So this is a, um, a, an appeal to his readers to um, you know, step back from your regular belief and appeal to authority and start to uh, open, be open to the idea that church authorities, for example, and, uh, are potentially open to error, right? So although this um, text, Seek It Known, felt very clearly into the new dialectic teaching style. So you can see when we did that dialectic and we were saying, like the authorities are on this side and they all say this, and then the other authority says the dogs, no dogs can't go to heaven, right? And so then how do you deal with that, right? And so this, this text that he writes um, fits very much into that. And indeed, um, some people have suggested that this is more or less like lecture notes. So he puts all these kind of things together with all the authorities, that's today's lecture, he goes through it all, and then we have the disputation uh, uh, in it. So many readers though, who are not familiar with dialectics, so many of these, um, 
uh, thinkers who are coming out of the old style of the cathedral schools I mentioned just sitting there reading the church fathers and the church fathers are the authorities <laughs> and so now he's arguing here you know by putting the church fathers up against each other and sh showing that they contradict and he's not resolving it he doesn't resolve at the end <laughs> he doesn't say which way is right or not um, so then that uh, he they more or less believe that this constitutes an assault on the authority of church fathers and ultimately even on scripture right so, uh, he has other works and other troubles. <laughs> so, he's been on the, you know, the downswing of fortune's wheel for a while. Jane, you have a question. What is the date of the Sikit? When is Sikit known written? Um, I'm going to have to look it up for you. I don't, it's... Uh, Maybe 10, 15 years later? Yeah, uh, so, it, no, it's just a few years later because it's before... So it's going to be after the castration, but before he gets back together and, 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 and talks to Eloise again. So it's in between. Is he already at Saint Yes, yes. So this is while he's at Saint Denis. And having this productive time period. Yeah, within the next few years. Yes. Um, Okay, so other works, he's also writing a bunch of other of his famous works. If you think of this, um, the old joke of a rabbi and a priest and a, <laughs> I don't know, a philosopher in this case, go into a bar so, and, and de debate about sin. <laughs> you know, and so this is what ends up happening. Um, and you know, it's not unlike what would have happened, um, let's say, in previous, it's not, this is not the first time that Christians have written um, a dialogue between a Christian and a Jew about whether Jesus is the Messiah or not. So Christians have written those disputations in the past couple hundred years and because the Christians are writing and they also are in charge of the society, the Christians always win the debate, you know, as far as the Christians are concerned anyway, you know, and so, uh, but in any event, this is not how he's writing this. Instead, he is um, he's using these different positions because the, uh, a philosopher who's not Christian, right, so he means an ancient Greek philosopher like Aristotle. Uh, uh, Jews who um, ha share that same you know, uh, Old Testament law background and things like that with Christianity, but not the New Testament stuff, not the Christ you know, component of it, not the Trinitarian part. And then Christians um, going through and saying, okay, each of these people have a different logical premise, right? They have a different way that they are viewing the world. And so he is taking about the lot, what are the logical consequences of the position that they're at? And so it's not to, uh, not designed anyway to just be an anti-Jewish polemic the way normally Christians used to write these. So you can imagine a lot of Christians reading it, they're like, wait a second, the Jews are coming off good in this. <laughs> you know, this is, what, this is not the way we're supposed to write these things. <laughs> okay, in the last of these then, oh, I'm sorry, he also wrote, a, uh, after that he wrote a book of ethics that's called Know Thyself. He wrote his own book of theology um, where he's reasoning out the Trinity. And I've, I've talked to you guys like I think a thousand times about the dangers of, of reasoning about the Trinity. <laughs> the Trinity is the most complicated. I said any Christian, I defy them, any Christian to speak for like more than five minutes on the Trinity without saying something heretical, uh, you, know, you can't do it. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I defy you, <laughs> five minutes, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, so he does that, right? And so he's also working on trying to come up with philosophical terminology for how to understand, you know, this philosophical concept, uh, this theological concept of the Trinity. And so in so doing, um, you know, he's uh, doing a lot of, let's say, applying different terms to things. And so what ends up happening is, Two of those, um, you know, he had the, those, uh, this teacher, Anselm of, not Beck, but Anselm of Laon, uh, who had two different students uh, who felt like Abelard, you know, had shamed their, their teacher and everything like that and were lifelong enemies. So they kind of get a hold of this book and they say, you know, we got him. <laughs> you know, so he has said things here, you know, that it's heresy, <laughs> you know, which it's hard not to do that when you're writing about the Trinity, <laughs> you know. But anyway, so they they more or less find that that he's uh, he's got he's fallen into the the horrible heresy of Sabellianism, uh, Sabellianism, which is to say modalism. So where, where what that means is so it, as you guys all well know, so there's there's only one God. <laughs> That God exists in three persons, right? You know, and so, but those persons, distinct persons, are not simply different modes of God. God is not simply um, being 
uh, the son at a particular moment and then being the father at the, another particular moment, right? Because if, if God was doing that, that would be Sabellianism, <laughs> and that's a heresy. So we know that's not the case. So anyway, <laughs> so that's what ends up happening in this particular case. He says something that, um, anyway, local people at a council in northern France uh, agree is Sabellian heresy, and so at that point Abelard is actually forced, in his work is condemned, he's forced to actually publicly burn copies of, of this book. Although he's still in a place where he has his, he kept the copy, <laughs> and uh, so now he's working, on, he works on revising it and writing a bigger argument with, where he doesn't actually change any of his ideas, but you know, just explains why they're wrong, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing, because that's how Abelard is. So anyway, so he's still, you know, anyway, he, he, he's sitting a setback, but that's not a devastating one yet. So, but he's unable to keep himself from trouble. Uh, and so to Jane's question, was he still at Saint-Denis? So he's still at Saint-Denis all of this time, but what he, st what he does is he um, starts questioning traditions about the patron of, uh, of the abbey, Saint-Denis himself, right? Uh, and so um, you guys may remember <laughs> I, that I, I was saying that anyway, that when we talked about Saint-Denis, Saint-Denis is equated with this guy from the Old Testament, Dionysius the Areopagite. <laughs> And Dionysius the Areopagite from the Old New Testament is equated with Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, um, a fourth century or fifth century um, uh, Neoplatonic Christian uh, philosopher who wrote a very important text that, for example, the people in Saint-Denis were so excited about that they used it to create the idea of stained glass windows, essentially, the theology of stained glass windows that's from that Neoplatonic stuff. And so now if you're gonna start to question, um, and it turns out, by the way, that Pseudo Dionysius didn't write that book, <laughs> and, that it, and that and that's the the knee that's buried in the crypt in in, in Saint Denis is not uh, the Dionysius uh, from the New Testament, who's probably not even a historical figure. <laughs> and so, in any event, it's a uh, you, you start to unravel that, and you can imagine it made the abbot really mad. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and so he starts unraveling that not just to more or less because he likes to jab people. Uh, and so that, and the abbot more or less accused him of being a traitor to the abbey and a traitor to France because he's the patron of all France. And so uh, Abelard is again in the doghouse for that. So um, there's, uh, there's additional moves then. He's not allowed to stay in the abbey. <laughs> he goes around to different places. At a certain point, Abelard becomes uh, abbot of St. Gildas, which is this very remote monastery in Brittany. So Brittany has this, is exposed to the Atlantic and has this, you know, uh, craggy coast and is one of the reasons why there's still Celtic people living there is because it's not desirable, right, to go, to go there so they can retreat there. And so the monks there, though, in the abbey um, have had their own way of doing stuff which maybe isn't as strict as they maybe should be or, or, you know, or where contemporary practices in France were. And so Abelard immediately, as a, he's the abbot of course, lays down the rules, we're gonna do this and that and some strict punishments and, and you can see he's got a really winning personality in terms of uh, getting, you know, winning people over. So they are very, very hostile to his reforms and they hate him very fast and he also hates them. Meanwhile, the nuns um, of Argentul, where Eloise uh, has been, um, uh, are forced to leave um, their abbey. Um, essentially, Suget, that abbot of Saint Denis, is able to assert a claim to own the property, and he kicks them out. So, he <laughs> so that's the end uh, for them. But Abelard helps Eloise then found a new convent called the Paraclete, uh, where she serves as abbess. And she, though, is more or less starting with a new institution that she has to build from the ground floor. And so it's very poor to start out with and they don't have any structures and they're more or less living in some very barren cells and have maybe a refectory or something like that, but they don't have a lot. And so it takes a lot of work and a lot of pain and poverty and hardship in order to build that up into an institution then that lasts, um, well, the building lasts, I think, until the, maybe the French Revolution. So Eloise's letters. So. Uh, while Abelard is abbot of St. Gildas off in Brittany and she's Elo, uh, abbess of the Paraclete, um, she acquires then that copy of the History of My Misfortunes. So he was circulating um, this letter, technically or supposedly a letter, right? The Historia Calam Calamitatum that I've been reading from. Um, it's talking about, for example, how he seduced her. <laughs> but he, of course, didn't ever think, well, maybe I should run this by Eloise, you know, or something like that, even when if I'm going to publicly circulate a story about her, right? And so um, he didn't get her say so, but she got a hold of a copy of the thing. So um, she, though, is actually upset 
Uh, she's still very much in love with him, and he's clearly suffering in the whole course of this story. I haven't gone through all the different things that you know, are his misfortunes. Oh, well, he, he, he claims that his monks are planning to assassinate him. <laughs> so those Breton monks are really don't like him, <laughs> you know, off in Brittany, and so whether they're going to kill him or not, he says they are. So Eloise then is very upset, though, that he had decided that he's writing this friend, <laughs> Uh, but she hadn't, he, about all these troubles, but she hadn't written, he hadn't written her. I mean, she's been suffering too. Why hasn't, uh, why hasn't she gotten a consolation letter and everything like that when he's off writing letters to his friend, right? So she begins writing Abelard in order to correct uh, that situation at the very least. So he should be writing to her and consoling her, right? And so we'll look at a little bit now of Eloise's letters to Abelard. She writes, I must confess... I was, uh, I was much easier in my mind before I read your letter. Sure, uh, all the misfortunes uh, of lovers are conveyed to them through their eyes. Upon your reading your letter, I felt all mine renewed. I reproached myself for having been so long without venting my sorrows. Let me always meditate on your calamities. So she's been reading the history of his calamities. Let me meditate on your calamities. Let me publish them throughout all the world, if possible, to shame an age that is not, has not known how to value you. So he's, you know, in her mind still, this great, this great um, light of the whole 12th century here, and, uh, and they're not, you know, he's getting his books burned and stuff, right? And so the people aren't responding the way she, they should be. Observe, I beseech you, to what a wretched condition you have reduced me, sad, afflicted, without any possible comfort, unless it proceed from you, because if you started writing letters <laughs> that were consoling, <laughs> you know, whatever, and that, then that, that will happen, right? Uh, be not then unkind, nor deny, I beg you, that little relief which only you can give. Let me have a faithful account of all that concerns you. So write me letters. This is what I need to have. Um, you cannot but be entirely persuaded of this. Um, <clears throat> so now, oh wait, so I, I missed my headline, headline here. Eloise then also, though, pushes back <laughs> on El Abelard's telling of the story. So there's a lot of different ways um, where El Abelard's story on the one hand is definitely an Abelard perspective story in the first place. Uh, and there are the people in the story who would obviously tell the story differently. Uh, on the other hand though, um, well anyway, there may also be motivations that he had for writing it the particular way he is. And so because she pushes back on him in several places, we can't simply read the Historia uh, Calamitatum as if it's exactly what happened, right? So he's, we have to realize that some of the things he said, um, anyway, he may, he may be saying it for a fact <coughs> or for a reason. So she says, you cannot but be entirely persuaded of this by the extreme unwillingness I showed to marry you. Though I knew that the name of wife was honorable in the world and holy in religion, yet the name of your mistress had greater charms because it was more free. The bonds of matrimony, however honorable, still bear with them a necessary engagement. And I was very unwilling to be necessitated to love always a man who perhaps would not always love me. I despise the name of wife that I might uh, live happy with that uh, of mistress. So this is a pretty extreme uh, maybe position to be taking if you might think of it as a, a, a woman in the Middle Ages, right? Um, as a position. So she would prefer mistress. So, um, but, you have not, uh, but you have not added, so you didn't put into your story, you didn't explain this part of it. You have not added how often I have made protestations that it was infinitely preferable to me to live with Abelard as his mistress than with any other as an empress of the world, and that I was more happy in obeying you uh, than I should have been in lawfully captivating the Lord of the universe. <laughs> so she does not want to captivate you know, God even, much less you. <laughs> so riches and pomp are uh, not the charms of love. True tenderness makes us to separate the lover from all that is external to him and setting aside his quality, fortune, employments, consider it him singly by himself. So, so in that same way we saw when he was in, in telling his story of his seduction of her, where he was talking about, again, why a philosopher 
you know, would actually fall in love with another person. He's not, he's not interested in, in fame and wealth and power. Philosophers know that those are the fleeting um, uh, things of fortune that fortune will take away when the wheel turns, right? And likewise, she's saying that too. And she goes on in, in this to say, there's all kinds of women who get married to guys because they got a lot of money, <laughs> you know, and, and they think that's gonna make them happy. Uh, and then they get saddled, and, she's, and she goes on, and she's more or less says, they get saddled with kids, and kids are loud and dirty and awful, <laughs> you know? <And> so, <laughs> so anyway, so she really, what she's really saying here is, you know, look, I love you for the being, the, you know, the, the, who you are as um, in, in this place and thought and moment in history and also eternity, right? Uh, and so that's where this, kind of, this love that we have is what we might call here, it's a platonic friendship, although in the, in the sense of Plato, not in the sense of how we now say that, where we mean that it means no sex, right? So the idea of it is, though, you're having a, um, a perfect philosophical um, love or friendship, um, you know, friendship being a thing of love, you know, that transcends um, the kinds of mortal concerns of wealth, power, all those kind of things. So, so she here is saying, I'm, I'm a philosopher too, and so even if I'm being called mistress, and that's what the world all cares about. And they say, oh, that's a shameful thing or whatever. Um, I don't care because you know, we're, we're a philosopher uh, couple here, right? So if there's anything which may properly be called happiness here below, so this is another, it's the good life. That's what the philosopher is looking for. I am persuaded it is in the union of two persons who love each other with perfect liberty, who are united by a secret inclination and satisfied with each other's merit. Their hearts are full and leave no vacancy for any other passion. Uh, they enjoy perpetual tranquility because they enjoy content. So she has a, she, her love is a philosopher's uh, love for him, which is not, it is not physical, uh, but it's not about, um, you know, shacking up with him in such a way so that so that uh, he's tied down and, and she gets his money. <laughs> he's got to take care of her, bring her food or that kind of a thing. In other words, the kind of concerns of the, of the earthly concerns of the world, right? So she um, continues passionately. There's a, it goes, there's a lot, we can't, I would love to read. The letters are really great. You should get a, you know, I have a copy copy. You can get them from the library and things like that. Um, they're worth reading, it's not that long. I remember, she writes, uh, for nothing is forgot by lovers the time and place in which you first declared your love to me and swore you would love me till death. Your words, your oaths are all deeply graven in my heart. The disorder of my discourse discovers to everyone the trouble of my mind. My sighs betray me and your name is continually in my mouth. When I'm in this condition, why dost not thou, O Lord, pity my weakness and strengthen me by thy grace? You are happy, Abelard. This grace has prevented you and your misfortune has been the occasion of your finding rest. <laughs> so this happened to him, <laughs> this thing happened to him, it makes him less worried about sex, <laughs> right? Uh, but this is not what's happened to her, right? The punishment of your body has cured the deadly wounds of your soul. <laughs> the tempest has driven you uh, into the haven. <laughs> God who seemed to lay his hand heavily upon you fought only to help you. He is father chastising and not an enemy revenging. A wife physician putting you to the same pain in order to preserve your life. I am a thousand times more to be lamented than you. I have a thousand passions to combat with. I must resist those fires which Jove, just to say Jupiter Zeus, God kind kindles in a young heart. Our sex is nothing but weakness, and I have the greater difficulty to defend myself because the enemy that attacks me pleases. I dote on the danger which threatens me. How then can I avoid falling? So anyway, <laughs> she's very eloquent, right, <laughs> in terms of her argument. So, um, so ultimately, so they have letters that kind of go back and forth. Um, she's passionate like that, and you just really, you know, kind of feel for her and all the things that she's trying to do. He, uh, you know, at a certain point, you know, is writing her back and saying, look, yeah, okay, I didn't say about how you wanted, you know, you would have, um, what was the thing that she said you didn't include? Uh, you know, how you'd rather be a mistress and things like that. Uh, um, 
and you, sh you also should stop talking about it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And, and so in other words, we're now in a different place. And at a certain point, he's like, well, we can, I can only go forward. Yes, you've reminded me my duty. I helped found um, this convent that you're the abbess of. And I'm, I'm prepared to, you know, because she interlaces it with requests for um, spiritual counsel and things like that. I'm prepared to answer those parts of the inquiry. And so, uh, and so ultimately, the, the, the letters become, you know, not love letters anymore and not this frustrated passion, but become two people trying to work on helping out their communities that they're, that they're leading, right? And so after that um, passion, um, that's one of the things that anyway, that was one of her goals. She wanted to have continued um, access to him and talking to him. She wanted to have uh, him, his thought uh, turned to address anyway, to be participating in her conversation, her convent. And so she succeeds in a way in that way. She can't rekindle, you can't go home again. She can't have that passion that they had earlier. Um, but she does get him to fulfill his role as a spiritual patron for her convent. So for example, he writes kind of a treatise on convents, in other words, on women monastics. And it's important because we don't have a lot of information. Um, he also writes um, kind of like a rule. So the uh, monks and nuns live under a rule. And so he updates um, kind of a rule of, for monks, but makes it more appropriate for nuns and things like that, at least what he thinks is appropriate for nuns. Uh, and so that again gives us a, a sense of um, Anyway, what people were expected to live in, in, in nunneries, in convents. And so a number of, uh, he also then writes uh, a bunch of sermons. So they can read sermons at their different um, religious festivals. And then he also writes actually a whole lot of hymns uh, for the nuns to use in worship. So he has been a poet of, of love songs and things like that. Now he's a poet of, of divine worship of hymns. O quanta qualia. O quanta qualia. Yeah, okay, so and to get then to the conclusion, <laughs> this is where we've been going for a while here. So um, he at this point, um, you know, has already kind of passed, you know, kind of his high, high moment of his reputation and he's now starting into the decline of, um, uh, he's had a kind of sometimes a hard life in, off in Brittany and things like that, so we don't know how broken down he is in terms of his health. Um, but what ends up happening uh, is that he has a showdown um, at the end of his life with another rising, very important pop star um, of the Middle Ages, Bernard of Clairvaux. So Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, he's part of the new um, Cistercian order of monks. And so the Cistercians um, uh, are feeling like, are part of a periodic thing of reform that happens in Western monasticism. So at a certain point, um, monks, like for example, the Benedictines that are living off in Brittany, um, they, they often are not being um, they aren't doing manual labor anymore. <laughs> they now have a bunch of serfs that do all the labor for them. They aren't maybe, you know, getting up as early in the morning to do their prayers the way they're supposed to. So there's all, they may have their mistresses living in the monastery with them. So there's, all, you know, they're, they may be quite wealthy, you know. And so essentially the, the, they are, they're no longer providing that kind of um, spiritual mojo <laughs> that all the people around want them to do, right? You know, so if you see these kind of hypocritical, lazy, rich monks, uh, how, is that, how is them praying for you, even if they do pray, how is that helping you with all the intercessions you need, right? And so, and so there's always this need for these new revivals that um, go back to that austerity. And so the Cistercians are one of these that happen right at this, this point. And so the Cistercians, um, eliminate, for example, all this decoration from the churches. They have very austere churches. They take the churches out of the rich lands and put them up on the, uh, on the craggy rocks and things like that so that they aren't just surrounded by all this kind of wealth. Um, they have all kinds of different, um, anyway, things that they're trying to get rid of the wealth of the Benedictines so they can get back that kind of spiritual mojo. And Bernard, uh, as this amazing preacher of his age, is able to kind of do that. So one of the things that he did, um, uh, by going around on a preaching circuit. There is one of the periodic um, uh, potential uh, moments of, of schism or you know, where, there's a, where they've had a, uh, an election and now because some of the cardinals or some of the electors have elected one pope and others have elected a different pope, there, there's this moment when there's two popes and this is a big problem for anybody because how do you decide 
who's pope. There's nobody who can decide who's pope under these circumstances. And so one of the things that um, Bernard successfully does is he picks which the one is the pope, and then he, and, which is, happens to be Innocent II, and he goes around through all the courts of Europe and preaches to all of the different kings and everybody, <coughs> that's the pope, you have to recognize him and do it now or you're in trouble and this kind of a thing. And so he's able to uh, turn all of um, uh, Northern Europe anyway, over to Innocent, recognizing Innocent as the actual Pope. Um, and then, because he's such a great preacher, uh, and uh, there's been a major catastrophe in the Holy Land, which is always happening too throughout the whole Middle Ages, the Muslims are always taking the Holy Land back. And so the, uh, the, uh, one of the Crusader states, the county of Edessa falls, and it causes a shockwave all the way back to Europe, and they won't need to have, you know, they need to have another crusade to go out. And so Bernard then goes around and preaches the crusade. Innocent asks him then to go preach the crusade. He does that very successfully, and there's another whole huge number of troops, including uh, the Holy Roman Emperor and King Louis of France with his wife Eleanor of Aquitaine, who uh, go to the Holy Land and have a very dismally unsuccessful crusade. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, but in any event, um, it's not for lack of preaching on Bernard's part. He got everybody to go. They just didn't do anything when they got there. So Bernard uh, was a scholar too, and he's a prolific author, but he's a scholar that's going back on that older model uh, you know, that we had talked about from the cathedral schools. He's not in this new disputational model. And he himself, though, believes that the path to God is through faith and mysticism. And so meditation on the word as opposed to, uh, and if you try to do this thing where you go into reason alone, like Anselmo Beck did, that, uh, and that Abelard does, then that's going to immediately lead you into error. So he says that that's, he's absolutely opposed to that. And indeed, he wrote about that publicly. He's a public figure, and he specifically is even citing Abelard as leading people into error by doing this. Um, and so that you know, Abelard doesn't like to get called out. He thinks very highly of himself. <laughs> he doesn't care how big a deal Bernard of Clairvaux is because he can out-argue anybody. And so Abelard then calls upon Bernard to retract all of the criticism, or if he won't, then he has to meet him uh, at a church council and have a public debate with him. Uh, and that, as I mentioned, is a fight that Bernard then declared, you know, would be like, Bernard would just be like a David against this intellectual giant, Abelard, who's always been that way, right? Um, however, in the event what actually happened is Abelard may well be great at um, philosophical and logical disputation. Bernard is great at politics, <laughs> okay? And so, actually Bernard is a master at politics. I mean, you got a, the guy, he wanted to be Pope Pope, right? And so Bernard knows how to do these things. So Bernard outmaneuvers Abelard. He arrives at the council early, has a private meeting with each of the bishops. He takes, has nothing to do with the, with the, the thing that they're supposed to talk about, which is to say whether or not reason alone should be uh, a philosophical question about which, you know, that's what, that's what Abelard is ready to have a big debate with him about, right? Uh, they're not going to have a, a dialectical debate about whether reason alone is sufficient to uh, talking about God. Uh, instead, he takes one of Abelard's books, this, this book that got burned before, and all of, the, uh, all of Abelard's theological propositions, he writes them all down, he presents them all to the, to the bishops and argues to them in a passionate, emotional, Bernard preachy speech that this is all heresy and it all has to be condemned. They all agree and condemn uh, like, like whatever, 24 points of Abelard's teachings as heresy. And so arrive, uh, Abelard, when he actually arrives then at the uh, debate, they're not debating anymore. Now he's arriving to answer uh, the fact that he's been condemned as a heretic. So anyway, got really outmaneuvered, right? So um, finding himself pre-condemned on charges unrelated to that question then, um, Abelard left the council without debating or doing anything. Um, uh, just fleeing back, though, to his monastery isn't going to uh, help because Bernard, well, it turns out that the Pope owes, <laughs> you know, owes Bernard a favor or two. And so he forwards all of the decrees of the council to the Pope, who agrees that Abelard is, uh, has been rightfully condemned as a heretic and excommunicates uh, Abelard. So that's um, the wrong guy to pick a big fight with. So um, what ends up happening though, just because not everybody likes 
Bernard, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine. And for example, the Benedictines don't like the Cistercians who keep on saying that the Benedictines aren't good monks, <laughs> you know, and so, um, and so anyway, so as a result of that, um, the most powerful abbot of the most rich and important um, abbey in all of Western Europe, Cluny, uh, Peter the Venerable of Cluny. There's so many amazing um, contemporaries who are really important figures who are all alive at the same exact moment. You know, everybody from Eleanor of Aquitaine to, um, as we mentioned, Suget, uh, to all kinds, you know, I mean, anyway, lots of different people. So Peter the Venerable then intervenes on Abelard's behalf. He's able to um, force, you know, them to have him and Bernard to have a, a, a reconciliation meeting and get the Pope to agree that as long as Abelard shuts up and just visit a monk in Cluny, then he can be unexcommunicated and, and, and uncondemned. And so he's able to just live in, uh, you know, anyway, as a, as a monk in Cluny for the last couple years of his life. So, buried initially at then one of the priories of Cluny, Abelard's remains are secretly relocated to the Paraclete, to Eloise's convent where Eloise continued to serve as a very respected abbess and continued her work training nuns and everything like that, reforming and building that institution. When she died then in 1163, she was buried beside him. Many, many centuries later then in the French Revolution, the um, convent was destroyed and there are now two disputed locations about where, they're, where they ended up. So there's a, um, a, a uh, the, monument here in a, in a um, uh, suburban cemetery in eastern Paris where they claim that they have, they went and grabbed them and, they, and they, they've reburied them side by side uh, in a suburb of eastern Paris and that may well be the case, uh, but the paraclete also says no, they're just in the crypt here still. And so anyway, so they're hopefully side by side <laughs> and, and you can always go to one of two places to, to anyway, to see them spending eternity together. So. And so that is the romance of Abelard and Eloise. <laughs> we need the, yeah, do we have yeah. a question? I have a question. I, I think I've seen some people requesting the microphone here. Yeah. Um, but also I have, like, Barbara Crompton is wondering what happened to Astrolabe. What happened to poor Astrolabe? Yeah. Where's Astrolabe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Astrolab, um, we don't have a lot of uh, information about him. He does seem to have uh, lived to adulthood. Peter the Venerable, um, you know, continues to be uh, friends with, Ab uh, with Eloise, who is an abbess. He's a big abbot of, of the same kind of order. And so he writes in one of his letters to Eloise, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to secure a pre-bend pre for your Astrolabe. <laughs> And so, in other words, um, as a important um, ecclesiastical leader, he controls all of these benefices that the different clerics need in order to become, you know, like an important local clergyman and have their all their money and, and, and income. It's like getting him a job, right? And so, um, so Peter the Venerable more or less um, says that he's going to, you know, get uh, Astrolabe at one of those jobs. Uh, we don't know anything more that happened. We can, we can only assume that he did, and he was able to have a great life. <laughs> so we don't know. Oh. Maybe he changed his name. Yeah, so maybe he just couldn't take it <laughs> anymore <laughs> at a certain Most point. parents who think you get into the limelight somehow just from Yeah, the, the, the point of it is, you know, the, the, the point being made is that, we, I have to repeat for the audience here. So they, uh, with those two parents, you'd think that he would have become a, um, you know, a scholastic philosopher, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the reality is he didn't grow up with them. <laughs> And so, uh, and so, that you, so it's different, right? So he's off living probably with Abelard's sister. Um, Abelard's sister did go into the night business as opposed to the philosophy business. So um, he was still in the clergy. So he would have got at some point or other he would have been in a school and get become a prebend. But I mean, he wasn't actually um, being raised by the two of them, and so he didn't. It didn't necessarily rub off. Other questions? Yeah, Elizabeth has a. Question or a song, probably. <laughs> what became of Eloise? Abelard, he was her lover. Once they lived at Saint Denis. Where they went, I can't discover. Abelard, he was her lover. All the while they come and they go. Where they went, I can't.
can't discover they have vanished like the snow where what the time and where the place is that is what i'd like to know where their glory and their grace is when they vanish like the snow. Aww. Sydney Carter. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that Elizabeth knows a song for every lecture. <laughs> so I love it. <laughs> so yeah, so they haven't, the story, you know, has ultimately, um, on the one hand, the, the tragedy of the romance, right? So that has inspired, like, it, it's been, you know, uh, anyway, inspired the retelling of the story many, many times throughout history. So that's one of the things that they end up being known for is the star-crossed lovers that we have um, kind of highlighted in the story. In terms of the other question, though, of the song, you know, where's, where's the glory and things like that, one of the things, though, that um, we, you know, we'll, we'll explore more when we talk about scholasticism and, and dialectic logic and all this kind of thing, but one of the things that we can kind of see, actually, as a result of work that both Eloise and Abelard did in formulating the ideas that went into his text is a, a, a sea change from what had been uh, appeal to authority you know, which had been going all the way back, you know, where it was so important to say, um, you know, what does the apostle have to say of it? And that means Paul. What does the philosopher, you know, say? That means Aristotle. You know, there was, there was uh, you know, what is the, uh, the geometer? I mean, there's, <laughs> they, they had different ones for all of the, uh, for where, where they were the authority. And so you, the, the, disputating, the disputations had stopped often when you got to that kind of authority or the, the search for knowledge was um, re repetition of appeals to authority. And indeed, that was what the medieval curriculum had been. But ideas like seek et non is a um, uh, undermining that previous reliance on the appeal to authority and the movement towards, in this case it was logic, but the idea of trying to think, do things out, uh, consider things based on, on reason, right? And so that's a pretty big um, and important change in terms of the old overall apparatus of Western civilization. And so they had a big effect and, the, and uh, Eloise is an in equal intellectual partner in these kind of conversations with Abelard. You could see very much just from the little bit of excerpts that I had, um, the degree to which her even passionate <laughs> um, arguments about love are philosophically motivated, you know, based on the same kind of uh, Platonic and Aristotelian mix of Christian philosophy that had been, you know, kind of uh, in the vogue right there. So the same thing that Boethius had. So, Anyway, they, they have, they, the, the path is still there and, the, and they had consequences. In other words, that they affected uh, Western thought in addition to inspiring uh, us to look back and say, I don't know, this is an amazing story between the two of them, what they, what they went through and the, the, how, how much the, the love was, is so evident when you read it in, in her passionate letters, you know. So. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, actually, you just answered the question I was going to ask. Oh, good. <laughs> because um, it's a, a fascinating part of history about the development of logic, of universities, the politics that went on in the middle uh, the medieval times, those times there. Um, I was going to ask you to sum it up a little bit to, to find out like why the romance of Abelard and Heloise was uh, uh, so important as a point in history. Yeah. Like what 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 you take out of it as a point, other than being sort of a picture of a time, like uh, was the romance in itself uh, in any way sort of significantly different than a romance like more modern, for example, or or, or was it uh, uh, like what is the, the, the yeah. point, point of this tragedy? Sort of? Yeah. Well. So one of the points that I, um, so I had a couple points for why I, I brought it to all of you. So, you. so we don't always, although it does seem like I'm focusing on star-crossed romances, that just kind of happened. <laughs> so it's not only, that's not the only reason. Um, uh, in part, I do think that this is an important, um, really important change where we're um, going, like I say, from appeal to authority to, to reason. Um, but I think it's also, um, 
Inter uh, I, got, I lost my train of thought, but I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I think it is also very interesting when we're, we're when to, ha uh, to recover, um, we don't have, we have so few voices where women who have been ed educated at any time in history, um, from antiquity through to the Middle Ages, are where, where their writings have been preserved and they are speaking so eloquently, uh, such a brilliant, are, you know, um, a person who has the, every bit Abelard's equal in terms of disputation, right? So here's a guy who's Bernard of Clairvaux is scared of going up against and actually only gets him by, you know, a side gut thing, you know, which Bernard's clever. <laughs> but anyway, that, you know, that, that's the only way he, he could, he wouldn't do it in open, whereas, whereas she went straight at him in these letters and, and she, I, you know, argues right around him. He's when he writes back to her after her first letter, he's on the defensive. He's kind of like, uh, 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 you know, I mean, so, so he wasn't prepared because he didn't lay the groundwork right. He didn't write his first thing with her in mind as the as the disputant, right? And so therefore, she was able to turn all that thing against him, and she ultimately didn't get the thing that she maybe really would have wanted, but was impossible to get. Uh, but she did get what the things that she could get. <laughs> From him, and so, and it's based on the fact that she could out argue him, and so, and so, having um, a medieval woman who is able to uh, break with, let's say, contemporary religious, even though she's an abbess, <laughs> break with con contemporary religious priorities enough to say, "I'd rather be your mistress than to, you know, to have been your wife," <laughs> uh, and, and and it's because I value what we believe as philosophers. Um, uh, over and above, uh, you know, because I'm, 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 I'm also a philosopher. <laughs> In other words, I am, I'm seeking to live the true good life. As she even said it, the only happiness that you can have under, you know, outside of heaven, right? And, and that's becoming a philosopher. So, so I think it's amazing um, that, because not that there aren't lots of women who maybe were able to be like that, but we don't have the words, right? Because they, the, the texts haven't survived and we don't have it. So. Um, so I tricked you all into a romance, you come for the romance, but you got to see a woman philosopher, you know, uh, and actually out-argue the greatest male philosopher, you know, and disputant of, of his day, right? Okay. And so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just saying, there wasn't a, a, um, a Bingen there, um, what was it? Uh, Hildegard of Bingen. Wasn't she contemporaneous? Yeah, so she, I think Hildegard of Bingen is also, is she just a little bit earlier than this? <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, so yeah, you're right. So no, it's not that there's nobody. <laughs> and and, and I th we, are, we had a whole lecture on Hildegard, right? Yeah, and so, and so that, she's amazing too. And so I'm, we're trying to, when we have them, we want to be able to look at um, you know, what women and everybody, you know, anyway, what we are saying at the time. So. Um, you, said, you said he picked the name Abelard. I said Eloise picked the name. Oh, he picked the name Abelard, yeah. So I don't, I, but I also didn't see I didn't see what it meant. <laughs> so it, it's a surname that he started going by when he went to when he got, went to the university. So it's not something that it was a family name. But then you know a lot of these names um, that the family names don't really exist yet. You know, and so um, contemporaneous to this again is when there's this guy um, Geoffrey Plantagenet, uh, and so he's the you know Count of Anjou. And he's and he's called um, Plantagenet because that's Planta gen, Genetum, <laughs> Planta Genetum, which is to say um, a broom, uh, uh, wheat broom, you know, in which he stuck in his hat or something. Oh. <laughs> and so then that guy, that surname becomes Plantagenet, and that becomes the main dynasty of of England for you know hundreds of years, right? Um, but why did why did that stick? <laughs> you know, so and so so these these names were just kind of you know were very free flowing at this time, and people um, actually often have different different names. Yeah. Yeah, I need you to elaborate on the relationship between celibacy and philosophy. I found that interesting, and I need more information on that. Yeah. Um, so I think that going back to it is it is interesting, right? So I I. Um, was talking to Brian Caruana, who's the director of the Encounter World Religion Center. He was doing his lecture on, uh, he just had done Judaism, he was doing his lecture on early Christianity. And he was saying, I don't get where um, these early Christians like Paul, Paul becomes just crazy obsessed with sex. And so Paul, um, for example, is 
um, writing, and he, he more or less says, you know, if you can't stop having sex, get married by all means, because <laughs> that's the only way you can have sex and have it not be a sin. <laughs> but it's better if you don't get married because you shouldn't have sex anyway, <laughs> you know, and this kind of a thing. And so this is a, so that's definitely imbued into Christianity going down, to, you know, at this point to the Middle Ages. And so there is a, um, you, so why, so where did that come from? It's not really in, in Judaism. Judaism has commands to be fruitful and multiply. That's not there. Um, we've had a lecture before on, on whether the Apostle Paul is gay <laughs> and whether that's his motivation. Um, but what we could say uh, in terms of the contemporary philosophy that Paul is also trained in Greek, Greek rhetoric and has been a, he's a Greek speaker, he's exposed to all these Greek ideas. Um, and so when you have um, ideas like Platonism, right, where Plato is, um, is very much talking about how the world of the material world and all of this physical stuff, that's the illusion. And what's real is the intellectual stuff, the ideas, right? And so when we're having those you know, real things, like real passion, like true love, which is not, this, so in other words, it starts to become a, a dichotomy, a dualism between um, all of the things of mind and spirit, which are so superior to all the things of flesh and body, um, that it's not necessarily Plato who's really opposed to sex, but Neoplatonists then, people who follow after Plato, who start elaborating this a lot more, and they create, um, let's say philosophical schools that are, that are very much about, you know, uh, uh, showing that you're gonna mortify the body. So you don't, you, you, you're beyond this physical stuff. It's like the, like we saw with the, um, the cynics. They're not, um, they're not, they're not mortifying the body, but they're not worrying about the day to, uh, you know, let's say where the day to day stuff is coming necessarily. There's this idea that, um, that in the, for example, the Gnostics, that if you, um, if you have sex, you're going to trap more divine spirits in the physical world, and the physical world's a mistake, and we shouldn't be here and have a physical world anyway. And so all of these kind of ideas are floating around in, um, let's say, the central antiquity, Roman times, and become an obsession for people going into the later antiquity. And so Christianity isn't the source of all that stuff, but I'd say that Christianity is just working within the milieu that everybody had at that time as they're all sort of uh, becoming kind of anti-physical, anti-sex um, people to show that they're beyond the, that, this kind of physical worldly stuff. And so then that's a legacy that continues on uh, all through the Middle Ages. And so for like the most saintly queens and things like that, like Edward the Confessor's wife, you know, since it's better for them, they're married, but it's better for it to be a celibate marriage, they didn't produce any children. And so that's why Edward the Confessor has no heir and, um, and William the Conqueror, you know, uh, ends up conquering England, right? So. All right. Well, very good on that. Uh, I'm <laughs> on that. Don't have sex note, <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, we'll conclude, and uh, we'll go ahead. We can have our discussion here offline, and we'll thank everybody for joining us. And maybe um, Landra will come back and tell us.